Today, I thought we would speak on scaffolding of the spirit because I knew the stage was going to be full of scaffolding. And I thought, I'm going to tie this in somehow. And uh, we're here today to really talk about, I would, I would say, one of the greatest things about the Christian faith. And that is that we have a relationship with God via his Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of us. When I first became a believer at the age of 16, the thing that shocked me the most, I think, was not so much that Jesus Christ had died for our sins and was buried and rose again. That was a wonderful truth that I placed my faith in. But it's what happened when I believed that. There's truth, and then there's what happens when you believe a truth. How many know what I'm talking about? I mean, you can believe right now, like, that your seat's on fire. You can believe that. But you'd probably still say you sat there. But when you actually feel the heat coming up from underneath you, you jump up and run out of this place screaming. And that's because there is a difference between belief and experience. And when the two are joined together, that is incredibly powerful. You see, all over the world today, there are people who have faith. Faith in their God or faith in their goddess. Faith in this person or that religious system. They have faith. But the major difference with Christianity is we don't just have faith in our God. We can experience him. And that is what is so exciting about the Christian faith. That when I place my trust, my faith, my pistis in Greek, in the death, burial, and resurrection, I experienced Jesus. I experienced the risen Lord. I experienced his Holy Spirit in my life. I can remember getting down on my knees in 1992 and his presence entered my bedroom and I was really quite freaked out by it. I didn't have a clue what was going on. For 16 years of my life, I had never experienced anything spiritual. And there I was just getting on my knees. I knew the truth of the Christian gospel and I responded to it in faith. And when I did, he entered my room. And as I confessed my sins and as I cried out to the Lord, and I said, Jesus, I want to make you my Lord and my Savior. That presence that was in my room, that Holy Spirit came on the inside of me. And he transformed me instantaneously. That's the power of God. Now, there are some things in our life that we have to work at. We have to work perhaps on our language, perhaps work on our behavior, perhaps work on our relationships. There are certain things in life that God says, actually, I'm not going to do for you. I will help you. I will give you some grace in this area, but you have to work hard at it. And then there are other things that only God does. And that was one of those things in my life. The Holy Spirit came into me and he transformed certain parts of my character. The first thing for me, at least, was he cleaned up my language immediately. Prior to that evening in 1992, I swore every other word, perhaps not around my parents, but around my friends outside of the home. I swore every other word, effing and jeffing and all over the place. Now I use words like codswallop. They're perfectly fine. But at that evening, when the Holy Spirit filled me, not only did I stop swearing, I couldn't swear. It wouldn't come out of my mouth anymore. My vocabulary completely changed. And I thought, why is this happening? And of course, later on, as I began to read the scriptures for myself, and I began to read the New Testament, it says, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. There's a command not to use bad language in the Bible. I didn't know it was there when the Holy Spirit changed me, you see. And another thing he did, he gave me additional confidence on that evening. Now, he didn't take me to 100%. But where I was perhaps at maybe 10 or 20%, he boosted me maybe to 50 or 60% confidence. So now, with this experience of the Holy Spirit, I was able to go out and start sharing my faith with my friends in the college, in the sixth format where, where I was. And so he helped me. He changed me. And that's the beautiful thing about our God. He loves you just the way you are, but he loves you so much he doesn't want to keep you the way you are. He wants to constantly improve you and change you and strengthen you and build you. And as I mentioned, there are some things he will really help with. There are other things he says, right, come on, don't be lazy. You've got to work at this too. And on that evening, he transformed my life. Now, as we move forward a year or two, I was really, really praying for the filling of the Holy Spirit. 
I began to read books about great evangelists of the past who could heal the sick, drive out demons, and some of them even rose the dead. I began to study the gifts of the Spirit like prophecy and healing in tongues and interpretation, and I began to hear people around me speaking in other tongues. Now I'm like, Lord, if your word says that believers can do this, and I can see believers doing this, and I'm reading about believers through the last 2,000 years who performed the supernatural signs and powers of your Holy Spirit, why am I not doing any of this? Why am I not prophesying? Why am I not speaking in tongues? Why am I not seeing the sick getting healed? Why don't I come across people who are demon-possessed so I can drive some demon? Why was it happening for them, but it's not happening for me? I know you live in me. I know you're my Lord and Savior. I know I have your Holy Spirit. And as I began to study the scriptures, I began to realize there were two things I needed. Number one, I needed to ask for these things. When you come to the book of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says, eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. They're not just going to come. They're not just going to pop into existence one day in your life. You have to eagerly desire the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the second thing you need, which I noticed all the way through the book of Acts, is that every time they moved to preach the gospel, every time they were moved to heal the sick, every time they were moved to prophesy, there's this little phrase that comes just before, and it says, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to prophesy. And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at them and declared the resurrection of Jesus. Over and over again, you get this phrase, and they were filled, and he was filled, and she was filled. And then the miracle came. And so as I began my own personal study, I'm like, Lord, I know I need to eagerly desire these things. And Lord, I want to be filled with your spirit. So I began to cry out to God. And for six months, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. I prayed my little socks off that, God, you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. I was probably praying for hours a day, every day, every opportunity that I had for a believer to lay hands upon me, to pray for me to be filled. I sought out believers. I sought out pastors. I sought out ministers. I sought out anyone who could lay hands upon me to fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit. And for six whole months, diddly squat happened. And I was so frustrated. I'm like, Lord, other people can do this. The apostles did this. I'm reading through history. People are doing this. And I've been praying now, Lord, for months. I can imagine the Lord in heaven just looking at me, just like laughing, like, months? Are you joking? Um, like my kind of apostle, they pray for years. Months? You've been praying for weeks? Well done, Paul. And uh, so I'm like crying out to God. I'm getting frustrated. I'm like, Lord, I need more of your spirit, more of you in my life. And uh, I was invited to go to this youth retreat in, in Wales called Kefen Lee. That was the name of the place. And when I was there, there was a South African minister. He was preaching the gospel, a very clear gospel message. And uh, he began to preach about the power of the Holy Spirit. And something began to stir in my heart as he did so. And he said, if there's anyone here today that wants to be filled with the power of God, and maybe you want to speak in tongues, maybe you want to prophesy, come forward and I'm going to pray for you. And I'm like, I want it. I was so desperate. Have you ever been really, really thirsty? Like, just so thirsty, and there's not a drink anywhere, and you're like, oh, it's like a sports day or something. You're watching your kid at school, and it's, the sun is beating down on you. You just want to get through the races so you can have the refreshments afterwards. I was like that with the Holy Spirit. Lord, I want to be filled. I want the power of God moving in my life. I was so thirsty for him. I was so hungry for him, and I walked forward, and he just laid hands upon me like every other Christian had laid hand upon him. And he prayed for me like every other Christian had ever prayed for me. It was no special prayer. He had no, his hands were not glowing. He just touched me on the shoulder. And the moment he did, the fire from heaven fell. It flashed through me and I began speaking out in other tongues. And from that moment onwards, from that moment onwards, as the weeks and the months and the years rolled by, God began to release in my own life and ministry gifts of healing. Uh, I came across many, uh, not so much today, but many, many encounters with people who were demonized or vexed with spirits. We were able to cast them out of people. Uh, even saw prophecy and visions in my life. But you need to understand that these things, generally speaking, don't just happen for you. You're not just going to wake up one morning and suddenly you're going to be this great prophet. I mean, it could happen that way, but generally speaking, 
The New Testament encourages us to eagerly desire, to press forward, to push in, to pray, to wrestle with God for the blessing. Because the one thing that God is really interested in you about is your character. It's not your ministry. It's not your bank balance. It's not your health. It's not your popularity. God really isn't so much interested in that stuff. I mean, he will help you out from time to time occasionally. He has helped me out in those things when I pray. But that's not number one on God's agenda for your life. Number one on God's agenda for your life is your character to be transformed into the image of Christ. Because the only thing you take with you from this existence into eternity, into heaven, is your character. And if your character is weak, if your character is small, if your character is a bit rubbish, you are taking that small, pathetic, little rubbish character with you into eternity and you are conformed into that state. What you learn here, you take with you. As Gladiator said, what you do here echoes into eternity. So what you want for your life in the here and now is development. You want to grow. You want to become as, mo as much like Christ as possible. Because in the next life, Jesus said, there are rewards for believers. You're going to stand before the beamer seat of Jesus, and he is going to give each one of us rewards. And some people are going to get few rewards. You're still going to get some. They're going to be pretty few. Some of you are going to get kind of moderate rewards in between. Some of you are going to get amazing rewards. Your salvation is not at stake, but your rewards are. And so you need to make sure that you are chasing and you are pursuing and you are living a life for him. That you're not trying to build a business empire for yourself. You're not trying to build a big bank account for yourself. You're not trying to live selfishly. Oh, if the Lord wants this, he can always ask. God's wallop. He's already asked. He said well, he wants 100% of you right now, not in the future. Are you any amen to that? God deserves nothing less than your 100% best. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And he says, hunger for me, thirst for me, I will satisfy you. And when he satisfies you, guess what? He'll make you a bit thirsty again. So you've got to go deeper. you will put through tests and trials. How many believers, how many of us moan when we go through tests and trials? Guilty. And we think, have I done something wrong? Am I living in sin? What is it, Lord? Why am I going through this test and trial? And he's saying, I'm trying to develop you. I'm trying to build some spiritual muscle in you. I'm trying to develop your character for eternity. Um, in 1974, Philip Petit performed one of the most daring stunts in all of human history. He walked across the Twin Towers, uh, more than 1,300 feet above the ground with no harness or safety net, and he had to rely on his P, I don't it should say pole. I don't know why the O-L-E isn't there, but it, he relied on his pole, his training, and his sheer courage to take each step. Now, how many of you have ever seen the film The Walk? Before. Some of you have seen the film The Walk. I highly recommend it. There's not, I don't think there's any nudity in it that I can remember. There's no bad language I can remember. But uh, it's a fantastic film about what this guy did. Because he wasn't allowed to do this. He was breaking the law by doing this. And he assembled a whole team of people. They got the cables together. And for months, he would go in and out of the Twin Towers, taking photographs, getting, writing down the times of when people came in and out of the lifts and when the workers were there. And he managed to find a way to get his entire team into the Twin Towers just before they were finished, before they were completed, get them right up to the top, put this cable across, and then he walked backwards and forwards across uh, the chasm between these Twin Towers. And he didn't just walk across. When you watch the film, you'll see that he walked backwards on the wire. He laid down on the wire and just hung off of the wire between the Twin Towers. 
But he was a man who was absolutely bold. He was absolutely fearless. And what can we learn from his example? What can we learn? Well, that pole of his, I, I can use it as an illustration of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings balance to your life. How many of you are sometimes a little bit emotionally all over the place? How you know what I'm talking about here? Yeah, yeah. One minute you're up, next minute you're down, you've had a bad night's sleep, you haven't eaten the right types of food, you're up and you're down, you're all over the place. And you feel that your life is completely out of balance. I want to tell you there is someone who can bring complete and total peace and joy and life and balance to your life. His name is the Holy Spirit. When you become controlled or filled with the Holy Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, he brings this peace that is beyond understanding. And I experience that regularly. Sometimes people ask me, what's the best argument for the existence of God? Is it the teleological argument? Is it the cosmological argument? What argument is it? The best argument for the existence of God is my personal encounter with him. He has changed my life. He changes it every single day. And he is with me. God promised, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Do you know what that means? He's not going anywhere. Even when you try and run from him, he runs after you. He isn't going anywhere anywhere. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And we have, in a sense, the pole of the Holy Spirit given to us to keep us in balance. So we do not fall to the right and we do not fall to the left. Life is difficult at times and we need God's help. Can I hear an amen to that? John chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit has been given to you and he's been given to me as a guide and one who grants wisdom. Jesus says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. Everyone say all things. And bring you to your remembrance all that I have said to you. The Holy Bible says that you have an anointing within you that teaches you all things. In fact, you don't even need a man to teach you anything. It's good to have a teacher or a pastor, of course. It's good to study the scriptures. It's the word of God. But you have an anointing on the inside of you that should train you and teach you in all things. If you remain in prayer, and if you remain seeking after God, thirsting and hungering, the Holy Spirit will tell you what is right and what is wrong. You have a conscience that has been made alive again by the Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of you. And we must be ever so careful not to grieve him. We must be ever so careful not to harden this conscience because it's through this conscience he begins to speak to us. If there is any moral ambiguity, you're not quite sure, is this the right thing? Is it not? Get down on your knees and pray and say, Lord, lead me. Is this the right decision to make? Is it the wrong decision to make? But let's be honest, nine times out of 10, we already know the right decision to make. The Holy Spirit makes it so very clear. The next thing the Holy Spirit does to us, he sanctifies us and he transforms us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, we read, And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being, let's do that word again, we are being into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit or the Holy Spirit. Here we're being told by the Lord through the Apostle Paul that every single one of us We're in the transformation business. God wants to transform you. And how often we try and hold on to our old way of life, our old personality, our old character. Well, I've been this way all of my life. Don't try and change me now. Tough. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're in the transformation business. God is changing you. God is transforming you, hopefully for the better. Of course, if God is involved, it's always for the better. But don't be one of these stubborn people that sticks their heels in the ground and says, right, I'm not moving. I'm not changing. I've been this way my whole life. I've never been confident. I've never been popular. I've never been full of joy. I've always been miserable. Well, it's time to change. Because if you've got Christ living on the inside of you and you're not becoming more joyful every day, more peace-filled every day, more empowered every day, if you can't take on the enemy, if you're still scared of Halloween, then you need to grow up, you need to mature, you need to transform, you need to get some Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Because if you're still scared of the principalities and powers of this world, you don't know who you belong to. 
You belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, the most powerful being in all of existence. And you know where he lives right now? On the inside of your heart. So if you're not changing, if you're not transforming, if you're not allowing the oil of the Holy Spirit to grease your wheels, then he's going to send trouble into your life. He's going to send trials you don't want to change you. How many of you want trials? No. Get on your knees. Start praying. I want the oil of the Holy Spirit to change me. Fill me, Lord. Change my language. Change the way I speak to my husband. Change the way I speak to my wife. Change the way I speak to my children. Change the way I speak. Change the way I act. Stop making me a a taker. Make me a giver so that I give into relationships. I give into people. I give. I love. I show you. Help me change. We all know our shortcomings, but how quick we are to focus on the shortcomings of others. If you want to change the world, first of all, start by changing yourself. And the Holy Spirit will help you do this. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Amen. Do you love God? Man, I love God. You know, God is a, a coach in our life. How many of you have been to the gym before? I'm looking at a, a room full of burly people in here. Big, strong, muscular, thick neck. I'm just talking about the women at the moment. <laughs> if you've ever been to the gym, you'll see that there are those people, they work out by themselves. And there are those people who have a little bit of money. They hire a coach. And that coach draws alongside them and pinpoints exactly what they are doing right and also what they are doing wrong and in the next video we've got this guy we're going to call him bob and bob is going to try and lift an incredible amount of weight as he does so i want us to give him some love and support let's cheer him on yes okay let's do this you, you all with me on this i know trina is i can hear trina you all with let's let's show him some moral support come on come on bob He can do it. He's doing it. Yes. Yes, Bob. He's doing it. Well, oh. That went bad. Um, I don't quite know what to say. Bob died. <laughs> See, that's what about you. Yeah, I was looking at that. I thought, that's too heavy for Bob. Bob can't lift that. And uh, that's the thing with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will never take you beyond what you can control or what you can master. Can I hear an amen to that? Yes, you will be put into times of testing and trials to, to develop perseverance and character. This is essential for you. This is essential for me. This is why in the scriptures, the New Testament, it says, do not consider it strange as if something weird were happening to you. Don't think it's a weird thing when you face tests and trials of many kinds. All of this is done to develop you, to develop your character, to develop perseverance, to make you more Christ-like. And none of us want to hear this kind of word. But when you go to the gym and you've got a good personal trainer, that personal trainer isn't going to get you working out with 2kg every single week. You know, oh, it's so easy today. Don't worry, next time it's going to be dead easy too. Another 2kg, brilliant. Yeah. When you go to a gym and you've got a really good personal trainer, they will start you, she or he will start you on maybe 2kg. Then the next week, 4 kg. After that, maybe 5, 10, 20. And they will keep on pushing you. They will watch to make sure that you've still got good form, that you are performing the exercises correctly. And if you're able to do that and you're maxing out each time with those reps and with those sets, they're going to up the weight a little bit more. They may add a few more reps in there, maybe an additional set. They will keep on pushing you so you continue to grow in strength, in agility, in power, in ability. That's what a good coach does. And that's what you've got in your life right now. The Holy Spirit is the best coach of all, and he is egging you on. He is saying, well done, you've just managed your first 2 kg." Now we're going to try 4kg. And that's what I noticed in my early Christian life. The first person that I laid hands upon and saw get healed, I wasn't even really planning on doing that. My friend was very sick. He was in hospital. His body was swollen up with poison. Uh, I was waiting for the pastor of my local church to come in and pray for healing. He didn't. He came in and prayed, Lord, be with him in this terrible situation. And he shoved off. I thought, that's no prayer of faith. 
And I thought, well, I'm going to pray for you then. And the next day I came into the hospital with a, uh, a whiskey flask of, uh, I think it's vegetable oil. I didn't have olive oil, I had vegetable oil. I poured it all over my friend Michael. And as I touched him, the power of God went through him. And as I stood up to leave the room, all the poison began to pour out of his ears. And that was the first miracle that God kind of put me on the, um, on the journey with of seeing more and more miraculous healings. And me and Sarah, you can ask Sarah afterwards just to confirm this, we have seen countless miracles uh, that Jesus has performed through us. But he only gives you what you can handle at that moment. Do you know what I'm talking about? My very first encounter with somebody who was demonized was in Westgate Street in Gloucester. There was an occultic shop there. And uh, I can remember just kind of reading about demons in the Bible and people in the church talking about demons. And I thought, I want to find out what this occult stuff is all about. So I decided to go into this shop and I was well prayed up before I went in. As I was walking around the shop, I saw like Ouija boards in there, tarot cards, dream catchers, crystals, the normal sort of paraphernalia you see in these occult shops. But then I heard this person growling, like, and it was quite loud. What is that? I'm looking around, looking around, looking around. And when I come around the corner, there's the shopkeeper on the desk looking at me. Well, I thought, he ain't going to make many sales like that, is he? That's not a very good way to, um, what's an old Arab saying? If you can't smile, don't open up a shop. He ain't, he ain't selling anything that day. But he was demon possessed. And what he was recognizing in me was the spirit of Jesus Christ. Jesus was in me. I was prayed up. I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I was walking around just because I wanted to learn about the occult and what people in the occult, the sort of things they buy. And because my presence was in that demon possessed, uh, that shop, that man who was controlled by Satan, he began to react. He was growling like a dog at me. And I thought it was my time to leave, so I did. But that was my, in a sense, introduction to the demonic realm. And then after that, I began to encounter all kinds of strange things and strange activities. And the reason I'm sharing this with you today is not to brag and boast about my ministry, because it's not me. It's what Jesus has done through me. It's through prayer. And it, the same things will happen in your, your life. I will almost guarantee it that if you get serious about seeking God for his presence, for his Holy Spirit, for his power, you will see the gifts of the Spirit operating. One day you may start speaking in other tongues. You may start prophesying, having visions and dreams. When you pray for the sick, no longer will they just get up still sick and leave. They will come back to you a week later and say, hey, you know you prayed for me? It's gone. I went back to the doctor. They took an x-ray. It's gone. And you will start to get reports. And how wonderful it would be if week after week, during the worship time, we had like a, a queue of people wanting to come up onto the stage and say, this week, God used me in this way. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Every single one of you, God used me to heal the sick, to drive out a demon, even maybe raise the dead. Do you think that's still possible today? I don't know. Don't you think God's power has diminished for over 2,000 years? I mean, it's been a long time. Doesn't God's power kind of drip away like a, a bucket with a hole in it? Doesn't it kind of diminish over time? No? Heresy. <laughs> same God, same power, the power that rose people from the dead in Jesus' ministry, the same God who rose people from the dead in the apostles' ministry, in the early church's ministry. He's the same God that's living in you right now. And he is just waiting for you to get hungry. He is just waiting for you to get serious in prayer. He says, when you get serious, oh, Lord, I've been praying for a couple of months. <laughs> Keep going, daughter. Keep going, son. Keep pressing in. Keep wrestling like Jacob did. Jacob didn't wrestle me for two minutes and get a blessing. He wrestled all night. And that's not wrestling in prayer. That's physical fighting. He had a scrap with Jesus. And he won. He won. Jesus could have dismantled him any second. Jesus is the ultimate UFC fighter in all of history. He could have absolutely demolished Jacob. But what happened? Jacob won because Jesus let him win. But he didn't let him win easily. And he's not going to let you win easily. But when you have that breakthrough... Praise the Lord. It's going to be so powerful in your life. Can I hear an amen? amen? For witness and service. Jesus said, you might receive power. What? You questioning my theology against you, 
You. Will. What does will mean? Is it definite? Hundred percent. You will definitely one hundred percent receive power when you receive the Holy Spirit. What's that Greek word for power there? Some of you know, dynamis. Where do we get the word dynamite from? Dynamis. What Jesus is saying here is you will receive dynamite power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Dynamite power. It's the same word where we get dynamo from. Dynamo, where you're charging up electricity. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it is for the purpose of number one, changing you. Number two, changing the world. But you can't change the world until you are changed. Jesus couldn't move in the power of the Spirit until he had overcome the devil in the wilderness. He was filled with the Spirit, but he moved back in the Galilee in the power of the Spirit once the devil was defeated in his life. Can I hear an amen to that? It's the same with us. You're not going to give an AK-47 to a three-year-old. Hey, mummy, look at me. How much damage? You'd give an AK-47 to a trained soldier in the army. They've had training. God will not give you a massive amount of dynamis power until he can trust you with it. Because otherwise, you're going to make yourself look like a wally. You're going to make the church look like a wally. And worst of all, you're going to bring dishonor to the name of Jesus. So get into training. Can I hear an amen? This is why I always encourage everybody in the church, everybody in the church, to get into the Bible college. Yes, you were born for a greater purpose. If you think your purpose in life is just to have a family and go to the office Monday to Friday, earn a living and get a mortgage and uh, buy a house and go on nice holidays once or twice a year and, and then retire. And then when you retire, then I will work for the Lord. Lord, I promise in my retirement years, I'm going to do so much for you. God's wallet. I know too many retired Christians and they're not doing as much for the Lord as they should be. For the last 20 plus years, I've met so many people with so much time on their hands and they spend it in frivolous activities. And the really dangerous thing is they've been like it their whole life. And in your retirement years, I'm sorry to say this and I don't mean to upset anyone, but you don't have long left on this earth to do something for Jesus. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow, but the older we get, we're absolutely not guaranteed tomorrow. So the older you get, the more you should be doing for the Lord. If you did a lot for the Lord in your 20s and 30s, by the time you reach your 60s and 70s and 80s, you should be quadrupling the effort because you're just about to meet him face to face. And he's going to ask you one simple question. What did you do for me? Is it enough? Has he given you a talent, 10 talents, 50 talents, whatever he has given you, abilities, giftings, provision, whatever he has given you, have you buried it? Have you put it on interest or have you worked it to produce a harvest for the Lord? Now, of course, I'm not so stupid as to think you don't need a job or you don't need a house or you don't need a holiday once or twice a year. I'm not saying that. But if that is your sole focus as a follower of Jesus, I'm telling you now, you are not a follower of Jesus. But I believe, so does the devil. The devil does his own thing. I believe. Yeah, but are you doing your own thing? Well, so you like the devil then. You believe, but you're doing your own thing. Mm, awkward silence in the room. A follower of Jesus is somebody who follows Jesus' teaching and obeys it, follows Jesus' example and does it. That's what a follower of Jesus is. That's why the early church very quickly took over the Roman Empire and why the church in the UK 
cannot even take over a local street. Because they were followers of Jesus. Are we? It's a question I want you to meditate upon. Are you a follower of Jesus? Or are you just somebody who believes and attends church?